We need to be able to have conversations without feeling like we're going to say something that gets us thrown in jail because people happen to be offended. All right, everyone, welcome back to the Pangburn Podcast. So great to be with you all again. Number 57, we've made it this far. Today, we have the privilege of being in the audience of Mr. Stephen Wolfram. He is the creator of Mathematica, Wolfram Alpha, and the Wolfram Language, the author of A New Kind of Science, I just want to make sure I'm coming through. The author of a new, uh, the author of a new kind of science and a project to find the fundamental theory of physics. The originator of the Wolfram Physics Project and the founder and CEO of Wolfram Research. Over the course of more than four decades, he has been a pioneer in the development and application of computational thinking, and has been responsible for many discoveries inventions and innovations in science technology and business mr stephen wolfram welcome great to have you here hi um so i think uh what i wanted to get into uh first is i read that at age 15 you know other kids are hitting on chicks getting wasted starting fires and you're publishing your first scientific paper tell me about that paper it wasn't a terribly good paper. <laughs> it was okay. It was, yeah. uh, you know, what's funny, it was a paper that responded to a bunch of uh, physics discoveries that were being made by experimental physicists at that time about electrons. And the point of that paper was to discuss the possibility that electrons weren't uh, geometrical point particles, but were instead uh, extended kinds of objects. Well, that, that's the thing that hasn't really been believed in physics for a long time. I made the sort of the, the 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 hypothesis in that paper that electrons would be a certain size, ten to the minus eighteen meters across. Well, that's that turns out not to be correct. But now, with the with our current theory of physics, um, I think we actually do have evidence that electrons are not point particles. So I was right about that. The only thing is, I was wrong by trillions and trillions and trillions, a factor of trillions and trillions and trillions. Right. Um, so so yeah. So it was. Um, but you know, I, I the main thing I was interested in in science and physics was kind of the hottest thing at the time, and it was the thing that seemed the most fundamental. And so I got really interested in that, and I kind of uh, realized the meta point that you could figure out new things, kind of in the same way that you could do exercises in books, but it was much more fun and interesting to figure out new things. So, so that's why, how I got involved in doing that. And what did your parents think of this? You know, you're, you're 15 doing this. Did they, did they think, you know, uh, they had a really special child or did you have parents that were more like, why aren't you doing normal things? Like what's, what's going on with you? Oh, I think they didn't, they, they weren't particularly aware of what I was up to. Right. And, um, it, it was, uh, uh, I, I I don't know. It's yeah. uh, you know my uh, my mother was a philosophy professor, oh, so okay. she was not not completely unaware of academic things, but certainly wasn't going to read the stuff that I was writing. So it was um, uh, you know I, I think um, you know I have four children of my own who who do their own kinds of things, and um, it's uh, it's always interesting to see the kind of interface between what the child does, what the parent understands about what the child does, what the parent. Uh, you know what the what the parent would suggest about what the child is doing. Right. I think uh, one of my early, perhaps educational things was um, uh, younger than that age. Actually, talking to friends of my mother's who were philosophers of science, and uh, 
you know, here I was as a sort of science interested kid, and it's like, what the heck do these philosophers know? Um, you right. know, I, 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 you know, the real science can answer all the questions, and and then I have a good memory, so I I remember some of those discussions, and it's like, hmm. I realized 30 years later, actually, that philosopher wasn't as wrong as they thought they as, as I thought they were at the time. Right. So yeah. sometimes a, a, an interesting realization. Sometimes vague statements uh, can encompass a lot of things that, that philosophers may may make, uh, you know, in, in past history. And and science will maybe discover something about, you know, everything is made of very small things or something like that. And that will end up being the case. Uh, so you kind of look back and say, oh, OK, they were kind of on to something in the way that they were thinking. Yeah, I think one of the one of the main points is the how can you possibly know that type question where 100%, scientists yeah. get some model and they say, we know how things work because we have this particular model that explains these particular things. Right. And, you know, often the deeper question is, how can you possibly know that? Right. And you realize in the end, well, actually, that's just a model that captures certain things, but doesn't capture other things. And, and sort of it has those kinds of limitations. So you talked about uh, being a father a bit. What has fatherhood been like uh, for you? And how have you been able to balance that with all of the things you do in your career? I have great kids. What can I say? Yeah. And they're, they're mostly kind of grown up by now. Yeah. But uh the um, you know I think um, uh, for me, it's uh, uh, I think uh, sort of kids are one of the most interesting things that um, uh, that I've been exposed to, and I kind of view my life as a bit of a portfolio of different kinds of things. I mean, I, I work on basic science and intellectual kinds of things. I run a company. I make technology that hopefully is useful to people, and I have kids, and um, these are you know a. a a collection of different kinds of things that interact in different ways. My my kids have often encouraged me to. I I think my kids have given me more advice than than I have given to my kids. Right. And, Interesting. Uh, so uh, it's some, um, and they are um, uh, that they've been they've been good sources of inspiration for lots of different kinds of things. Well, I think that's a testament to you as a father if you're able to take uh, that input from your children, because I think there's a lot of a lot of adults that think that they always need to be the advice givers. But with, you know, I it's like kids start using, or at least when I was a kid, I started using all the technologies that were coming at us. And, you know, my, my dad uh, comes from a logging background and he didn't really use technology much. So he was having to learn a lot from us as technology, you know, me and my brothers as technology was moving along. So uh, I think it's important to, uh, you know, the, for parents not to have this, you know, self-righteous approach to parenting and, and be open to, you know, all facets, facets of learning from everyone. So I think it probably in, in my particular case, I'd been CEO in a company for a while before I started having kids. Right. And I, I, I always have claimed to my wife that I could never deal with children under the age of 10. That turned out not to be quite correct. But um, <laughs> uh, it's, um, it's somehow after you've, uh, after you've watched a lot of careers develop, it um, and you've seen sort of what happens as you interact with people in different kinds of ways. I think that sort of perhaps takes some of the edge off of the the. I've just got to tell the kids what to do. You know, I've got to. Um, uh, right. Yeah. I, yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of uh, there's so much learning to be had there when you have this the, the, this. It's it's almost like there's there's a lot of inspiration that I get off children when I see them learning new things and flipping over rocks and you know examining uh, certain things and it it gives me some scientific inspiration to see them uh, uh, do that. Um, so uh, how about like so at 15 you're publishing this paper. What what were some of the other things you were doing at that age? Were were your were your did your teachers see you as a gifted kid and were they kind of grooming you for a future in in science and physics uh or uh what, did, did you have some inspiring uh teaching figures or uh, tell me a bit about that experience i mean look i i grew up in england and uh i went to what turned out to be sort of the fanciest schools there i don't think i really knew that at the time right but, um, uh and you know in fact the um the elementary school that i was at is is uh, is pretty well known and, and had a very interesting group of kids. Um, and uh, it's kind of, it, in some ways, I, th I see it as having been downhill ever since, so to speak. That was the most interesting group of people I've been around. No, it's hmm. not quite true. But, um, <laughs> uh, but then I, I went to a, a fancy high school in England called Eton that's been around since, since before Columbus came to America, I guess. 
Wow. Um, and uh, uh, again, a, a rather concentrated group of um, uh, sort of it's broken in different pieces, but a sort of concentrated group of intellectual folk there. And, um, uh, you know, I, I, I in, in retrospect, I realize I was sort of a top student at a top school. And um, but I didn't really pay much attention to that. And I was learning, you know, Latin and Greek and things like this, which I said, I will never use these things that I'm learning here about Latin and Greek, but I have a decent memory. So I was, you know, and I and I like doing things well. So that kind of helps in doing doing school well, too. Um, but as it's turned out in in adult life, you know, I still have a, a Latin and Greek dictionary on my bookshelf near me because I end up uh, using them because I have to make up names for things. And those are those are good sources for for names for things. Right. But I, I kind of had two tracks in my life. I mean, I was doing sort of the the usual stuff one does in school. Uh, 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 and I was uh, uh, I did surprisingly well, considering that I really wasn't that uh, you know, that wasn't my main passion in life. And then I had my sort of uh, separate hobby activity of doing physics, which and I interacted with some teachers, but not not in any terribly serious way. Right. Um, and uh, uh, mostly I, you know, I, I ended up writing these long sort of treatises about physics uh, before I before I wrote that first published sort of academic type paper. Wow. And um, these these long treatises about physics didn't see the light of day for another 30 years. Something, um, you know, something must have turned you on to physics. Like there, like, was it, was it this drive to want to understand what everything is? Oh, it was, it was more mundane than that, actually. Okay. I mean, I was, I was growing up in the 1960s when the space program was kind of the big, exciting oh, okay. technology kind of thing. So I, I got really into that. And uh, uh, then I kind of, you know, I was like, how would you design a spacecraft? How do these things work, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And pretty soon I realized, oh, it's all based on physics. So I got interested in physics and I kind of made this sort of pseudo meta discovery that you can just read books and learn about things. Mm. I mean, nowadays, yeah. of course, there's the web and all that. But but um, back in those days, it was just like you can just learn this stuff. And OK, there's, you know, college physics textbooks and you can just read them. And um, it, it uh and I got um, I got interested, I suppose, in um, uh, the the hottest area of physics at the time was particle physics, right. understanding you know quarks and gluons and all these kinds of things, and um, so I got uh, I got really interested in that, and it was like I think I can figure out some stuff people other people haven't figured out, and that's fun, and uh, I actually was interested in some more fundamental questions about physics, which I didn't get back to for many more years. Um, and uh, because I, I, I started looking at them, didn't really get terribly far with them. Uh, there were these areas of, of particle physics that were very hot at the time that I was able to make progress in. And you know, if you work in a hot area, then people give you lots of positive feedback because they say, oh, you did some clever thing in this hot area that we all care about. And what areas were those? Uh, mostly in studying, well, this thing called QCD, the theory of quarks and gluons, yeah. the kind of what's inside protons and so on. Sure. And then I also was involved in in kind of early work on the relationship between cosmology and particle physics. How uh, in the very early universe, oh, you know, I was studying what would happen to heavy particles that exist that get produced in the early universe. Where would they end up in the current universe? How mm. many of them would there be? These kinds of things. Um, and I, I, I think uh, <clears throat> it was a time, you know, late 1970s was kind of the 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 peak golden age for for this kind of physics and a bunch of new methodologies had kind of just come online and uh uh there was a time when you could discover lots of things now i had kind of a secret weapon it shouldn't have been terribly secret but but it sort of was at the time which was i used computers to do stuff and for some weird reason that wasn't a thing people did i i sort of didn't realize until a long time afterwards that this that you know this idea of using tools wasn't as universal right. as one might have thought, so to speak. Right. And you know, what I had realized is, you know, in doing physics, you do all these mathematical calculations, they're kind of tedious. And I realized, gosh, you can get a computer to do these instead. And so that was what I got involved in doing. And uh, uh, I got to the point where I could do that really pretty well. And then I had this kind of tool that let me kind of leapfrog a lot of what other people were doing, was doing. Um, by using computers and by it's sort of me plus my computer was right. was was pretty smart me on my own i don't know but uh, uh it was um uh the, the you know so that was that was a 
uh, a thing that allowed me to get uh, get further in physics than I might have otherwise done. And computers have gotten a lot more powerful now, so it's just. Uh... Uh, and it seems like a never-ending land of opportunity. Since we're talking about particles for a second here, I, I, I'm just going to ask you this flat out. Do you think that we will find a particulate uh, representation of gravity? Uh, is, is the graviton out there? Uh, do you think we'll, we'll find it one day? Well, so I think we have, you know, at this point from what's happened in the last couple of years, to my great surprise, I think we've kind of cracked the problem of what the kind of machine code of the universe is like. So I think we really pretty much know the answers to these things. And if you're asking uh, kind of what, uh, that's a slightly complicated question. The answer is, yes, there are particle-like excitations of the gravitational field, which you can think of as gravitons, but I don't think that's the most interesting part of the story, so to speak. Um, right. I think that the, uh, uh, you know, one of the things that's come out in our uh, kind of recent model of physics uh, it kind of came out of things that I did in the 1990s and so on, is first first statement that might be kind of surprising, sort of everything in the universe is made of space. So in other right. words, it's it's not, you know, you might think, as has been sort of typical in, in physics, that, oh, there's space, which is just this place where you put things, right. and then there are the things that you put there. And sort of one of the big kind of realizations in our project is, Space isn't just a place where you put things. Space is actually made of stuff. And I've, and I've like, heard you talk about this in a hypographical sense, yeah. like like the, the uh, yeah. vi envisioning this as a hypograph. Is that kind of what Hypo you're talking hypograph. about? Hypograph, yeah. yeah. Well, yes, but, but, but I think a way to think about it that's perhaps uh, easier to get at is imagine you've got some water. Water seems like a continuous thing. You say, well, I can, you know, I can move the water around any way I want, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But in the end, we know that water is made of molecules and, and down if, at a microscopic enough level, that water that you think of as a continuous fluid is actually just a bunch of molecules bouncing around. Right. And um, the, the, the same thing is true of space. You think of space as just as a, a thing that exists and you can put things in it, but actually space is made of stuff. And I think the, the, we, can, we can talk about it like the atoms of space. And the question is, these atoms of space are just like geometrical points. And the yeah. question is, what's the relationship between these geometrical points? When we think about space at the level that we experience it, we say, oh, there's this position in space. You can move to another position in space. We've got all these positions set up. But when all you've got is this kind of bag of points, there's no notion of position. It's just, here's a bunch of points. They are the, the atoms of space. And so then the, the big issue is, how are the atoms of space related to each other? Right. And the answer is you can think about them, it's kind of like a friend network or something. Different, at, each atom of space can have certain other atoms of space that it's connected to. It doesn't have any definition of where it is, it just knows I'm, this atom of space is connected to these other atoms of space. And right. so that, that forms this kind of network actually in, in, in the formalism that we've set up, it's convenient to think of it as a hypergraph, which is just saying that atoms, there are relations between atoms of space. And in an ordinary graph, you're saying there's just, there are, there are two points, two nodes in the graph, and they have one edge that connects them. In a mm -hmm. hypergraph, you can have more than two nodes that are all related by a hyper edge. But that's, right. that's more of a technical detail. The, yeah. the most, most important thing is just this notion that space is made of something. It's made of all these atoms of space. Right. Maybe in our universe, 10 to the 400 atoms of space. Um, and they have some pattern of connections, and everything that happens in our universe is associated with the details of that pattern of connections. So when we talk about an electron or something, an electron you can think of as kind of a, a sort of knotted collection of connections between these atoms of space. Right. And it's, it's, it's not made of anything different from the rest of the universe, the rest yeah. of space. It's just a, a sort of a, a feature like a knot or something in the, in the structure of these connections of, between atoms of and space. And this is kind of one of the reasons why we need to start looking at all this is, is just various fields stacked on top of each other. Is that correct? Is that how you... What, what do you mean by fields? Well, uh, like uh, I've, I've heard physicists talk about how, you know, a way, a way to think about, like I'm talking about the Higgs field, like how things interact with the Higgs field. Oh, that's a, that, I mean, that's a more detailed technical issue. So, so 
the, the question is, the first issue is, what's all the stuff in the universe made of? So what we're saying is, at the lowest level, it's atoms of space with certain patterns of connections. The details of those patterns can be thought of as corresponding to gravitons, electrons, Higgs particles, whatever else. Um, and what we're seeing there is, I mean, one, one feature of, of this kind of structure where it's just a bunch of atoms of space with connections, one question is, what, what do these connections do? And the answer is, we think there are these just these rules that say, if there's a pattern of connections that look like this, it gets transformed to a pattern of connections that looks like that. And that, that process of kind of progressively rewriting the structure of these connections, that corresponds to the progress of time. So the, the extension of space, space is just this whole sort of arrangement of these atoms of space. Time is the progressive rewriting of the connections between these atoms of space. Mm. And so then the one question you might ask is, what is, does space have an existence independent of all these rewriting processes, independent of time? The answer is no. Space, the, it is these rewriting processes that kind of knit together the structure of space. So in a sense, at, at every moment, we are, the, the whole structure of our universe is being rewritten. There's nothing, and the fact that there is anything that has any degree of permanence is a consequence of there being sort of stable pieces to this network of connections that are preserved by the rewriting of the structure. And do you so, think you've stumbled upon the fundamentally unified rule that's at the basis of everything in any selected space? Well, so, so in our physical universe, I think we know kind of the, the, the structure of how that works at this point. Now, the question is, the particular rule that can lead to our usual description of physics, um, that's a more complicated question and a more philosophically tangled one, because it turns out that what I've sort of recently really realized with, with more clarity than I had before, in some sense, the universe is running all possible rules. And we are, with our way of looking at the universe, we're sampling a particular slice through that kind of process of running all possible rules. And with respect to our particular slice, our particular way of describing the universe, there will be a class of rules that are convenient for us to use as saying, that's what's really going on. In truth, the universe is in a sense using all possible rules, but with our way of describing the world, we will say, we can best attribute what's going on to this particular set of rules. Although in some sense, it doesn't matter what they are. It's just that what, what rules we attribute the behavior of the universe to affects our way of choosing to describe the universe. Right. And, um, and this is, uh, so, you know, at this point, I think we, we uh, the, the sort of, the, the, in a sense, mathematical, it's not really very traditional mathematics, but in a sense, the formal structure, I think we've nailed it. I mean, I think we, we have the answer to how that works. Now, in terms of going from that to understand the details of every aspect of the Higgs particle and all those kinds of things, we haven't done that yet. Right. We are making steady progress, and it's it's really encouraging that often when you think you have a fundamental theory, you get to a certain point and you say, "Oh, there's this phenomenon. Oh, whoops, we don't we can't explain that phenomenon. We have to make this hack basically to be able to explain that phenomenon." That has absolutely not happened to us. Mm. What has happened is it's difficult mathematics. It's things that people, you know, I I don't know one mathematician in a particular area was was saying to me, you know about something we needed to know, he was saying, well, that's a very good question. You know, come back in a hundred years and we may know the answer <laughs> to that question. Well, Which is like, yeah, um, I've always, I've always been kind of obsessed with thinking about the, uh, the, the top, uh, topological representations of states and what, what it means to just take a, a chunk of state and, and see what's fundamentally the same about that. And, and then, uh, go out very far and think of uh, very large states, like maybe a few uh, universes uh, selected, and and try to come up with some you know logical statements that we can demonstrate, hopefully mathematically, uh, that will be true to any state that you uh, measure. So, uh, um, I was going to ask you, uh, what will a fundamental theory of physics? Um, tell us about any possible state or uh, or bit of space? Well, so the first question is, 
you know, I'm talking about these kind of atoms of space and the, all these patterns of connections and the rules that are applied to them. First thing that's true is, if you look in detail at how those patterns of connections evolve, it's really complicated. Sure. In fact, it is. It has this phenomenon that I call computational irreducibility. So one of one of the things you might think is, once you know the rules by which something operates, then you know everything about it immediately. But what computational irreducibility says is, actually, you may have to go sort of step by step and just see how the system evolves. Right. It isn't the case that you can do what often one hopes for in sort of traditional mathematically based science and just say, OK, now we've got the rules. Now let's just solve the equation and jump ahead and figure out everything about how the system is going to work. You can't in general do that in these kinds of systems. Instead, you're stuck basically just having to go one step at a time to see what the system does. And so, is this related to the uncertainty principle in, in any not way? Not really, no. No, no. no. Okay. the uncertainty principle is something, uh, uh, yes, yeah, so the uncertainty principle is a couple of layers above this. The uncertainty oh, okay. principle okay. is, uh, we, we can talk about how that works, um, but no, this is not. Well, this, this is related okay. to something sort of more fundamental, actually. Okay. It's, it's related to things like why we why why we imagine we have free will even when we have a deterministic set of rules that that run us things like that sure. um, it's also in a sense it's related to what does the progress of time really add up to that is right. if you have some rules and those rules define how a system works and you can say okay I'm going to go a million years in the future what's going to have happened What's the answer to, you know, what, what's the outcome of applying all these rules? You might say, well, I can just jump ahead and say the answer is 42 or something. Hmm. Um, but the, what computational irreducibility tells you is that in general, you can't do that. In general, there's no way to know what's going to happen in the system essentially more efficiently than just running each step and seeing what the system does. And so that's kind of, that's kind of why there's some sort of irreducible character to time. That's why, in a sense, that's, it's a sort of fundamental thing for, for all of us. It's like, uh, you know, what are we achieving by existing and sort of uh, going through our, our lives and things happening right. through time? Well, the answer is there is a computationally irreducible process that is effectively the one that we are running, which determines what the future will be. And it's not the case that we can just jump ahead and say, OK, I get it. I know the complete future because I know the rules. I might be able to just jump ahead and say, so I know the comp complete future. And I mean, the the, the origin of that phenomenon is is fairly interesting, and uh, maybe we can talk about it a bit. But but um, it's gonna it's gonna it's gonna take us a little bit off off this since we're, direction. Well, well, I wanted to since we're on rules, I really want to talk about cellular uh, automatons. And uh, can uh, and just quickly for everyone that's listening, can you summarize the uh, relation collection rules uh, in the Wolfram Physics Project that that leads to these uh, automatons? Well, no, wait a minute. So, so there are a couple of different things. So sure. first, first point is, if you're going to make models of things in the world, you want some kind of raw material to make those models out of. You can say, I'm going to write down an equation. It's going to have variables that represent different things. I've got integrals, derivatives, all those kinds of things. That's, that's been, that was the tradition of modeling from the late 1600s until quite recently. It's, you know, you want to make a model of something, write down equations and solve the equations. So a thing that I got interested in at the beginning of the 1980s is uh, if you're making models of the world, are equations the only raw material you can use? And I realized, no, that they're not. There's a whole other world of sort of raw material for making models of things, and it's just arbitrary rules that we can think of as being programs. In, a, in modern times, we can think of them as being things that you could run on a computer. But... The cellular automaton is a particular, very simple example of a of a kind of rule you can look at. And so in a typical case, you have just a, a line of black and white cells. And at each step, you say, I'm going to update the color of a particular cell depending on what its color is and what the colors of its two neighbors are. You just keep doing that over and over again. Now, you might have thought with a rule that simple, the only thing that would happen is the thing would produce some simple pattern of behavior. But the big thing that I discovered in the early 80s is that that's not true. If you actually go out into the sort of computational universe of possible programs and just do the experiment of, you know, start with a particular rule, see what it does, even some of the very simplest possible rules produce incredibly complicated behavior. And that's a, that's a, that was sort of the starting point for a lot of science that I've done is this fact that 
even though the rules are simple, the behavior may be very complicated, and that leads to things like this computational irreducibility phenomenon. But the, the point of a cellular automaton is it's this very idealized model for how things work in which you're just dividing everything into black cells and white cells and, right. uh, and so on. And, yep. and in fact, what, what then turns out to happen is that's a very good minimal model for lots of kinds of things, whether it's for road traffic flow and you know cars on a road or whether it's for you know pigmentation patterns on mollusks or all kinds of different things. It's a very good minimal model. But that model, in a sense, has an assumption about how space and time work. You're laying out cells in a particular arrangement in space and every cell gets updated in a sort of, uh, you know, ser series of ticks, in uh, sort of together in time. And right. so one of the one of the things that was sort of an important uh, conceptual breakthrough in terms of thinking about our physics project is the realization that to to make a fundamental theory of physics, we have to kind of go go below the notions of space and time that we normally experience and think about. And that means that something like a cellular automaton that has this kind of fixed notion of space and time isn't really the right way to think about it. And right. that's that's how we've ended up with these hypergraphs and these kind of atoms of space and connections and so on. But the thing that the role of cellular automata, in at least my life, is they're they're very easy to visualize and easy to do experiments with. And I just discovered a huge number of phenomena in this kind of computational universe of possible rules through studying cellular automata. And that's kind of one of the necessary pieces of intuition to have if you're trying to go forward to think about fundamental theory of physics. Right. So now we get to uh, uh, an interesting rule, I think, to you is rule 30. Um, I've just uh, brought it up for everyone on YouTube so you can take a look at it with us uh, as we talk about it here. Uh, wh what is special about rule 30? Well, it's kind of my favorite, all-time favorite science discovery, I suppose. It's, um, it's a... In some sense, it's the very simplest one of these cellular automaton rules that just has a thing that says, given a, black, a series of three black and white squares, what will the color of the center cell be on the next step and so on, just has a, a very simple rule for saying how that works. Yet when you just start it off with one black cell at the top, the pattern it makes is something that looks very complicated. And for example, even though the rules are very simple, if you look at, say, at the center column of that pattern, yeah. for all practical purposes, it will look completely random. And we used it as a pseudorandom generator in Wolfram language for, for many years. We, recently, it's been, it's been retired after good service because we found a slightly more efficient way to do it. But um, um, it, it's the, what's remarkable about it is very simple rule, behavior that is sufficiently complicated that it looks in many ways kind of random to us. And, and for me, the importance of that Back when I first discovered it, I mean, I, I first saw that rule in, in 1981, and uh, as is typical in kind of the development of science, I didn't really understand its significance until about 1984. Um, but uh, the, um, the, for me, the, the, the great significance to that at first was the, was the following thing. When we look at the natural world, one feature that we often see is things look complicated. And when we look at things in nature, we might say, gosh, if we humans were going to make that, it would be incredibly difficult right. you know, to make this kind of biological form, to make this kind of geological form, whatever else. It's like, that's very hard to make. And we might say, if we were trying to do engineering and trying to sort of uh, put together these particular systems that make that difficult to do. So there's sort of been this mystery. How does nature apparently effortlessly manage to produce all this stuff that seems to us so complex? Right. And so the big thing for me about Rule 30 is I think that's the secret that nature has. It is kind of using these computational rules to do something which turns out to be very ubiquitous in the, in the universe of possible rules, go from a simple rule to very complicated behavior. That's, that's what nature is doing all over the place. Well, what, no, the once, reason, oh, sorry, keep going. No, I mean, <laughs> the, the reason that we haven't been more aware of that is that in our current practices of engineering, we typically want to build systems where we can say, okay, if I do this, I can foresee what's going to happen. If I do that, I can foresee what's going to happen. And by building systems for predictability, so to speak, we're kind of cutting ourselves out of being able to let sort of computation do what it can naturally do. So we don't, we tend to avoid these kinds of systems that have simple rules, but very complicated behavior. 
as you were talking about seeming uh, complexity that we see, um, uh, not once did you mention God or God particle or, or the, the God equation or anything like that. Um, a lot of people would would be offended that you wouldn't uh, suggest that when when talking about you know uh, maybe the creation of, of geology or, or or things like that. What what do you think about uh, the the propositions of gods throughout the ages and their attempts to uh, you know perhaps answer the this problem of complexity? Well, I think that's a, that's a slightly different issue. I mean, the the, the questions of what has been learnt from sort of theology and so on. I mean, in a sense, if we look at the sort of long arc of intellectual history, you know, in the in antiquity there was lots of thinking that was classified as philosophy. Then, for a long period of time, there was lots of thinking that was classified as theology. Then it kind of went back to philosophy, and then right. went into science. Right. And and many of the things that I'm interested in and looking at are things that, in fact, reflect back to those periods of time when people were classifying the main kinds of thinking that were going on as theology. Right. And so there are there are a lot of interesting issues about uh, questions about you know why the universe exists and so on that that to my great surprise we have real things to say about now. And those things uh, we can kind of read some of the uh, some of the things that we're now saying we can we can see how do they relate to things that people had said a thousand years ago in the context of what was then called theology. Um, and it, it's pretty interesting to see that. But I think in terms of the, the question of how complexity gets made in nature and its relationship to kind of natural theology, for example, back in the 1800s, there was particularly, there was a, there was a sort of big, uh, there was a sort of a common statement of, you know, you find a, uh, a pocket watch on the ground, you know, yeah. what, um, you know, this was Where's a big effort for humans to make. <laughs> right. Um, this was a big effort for humans to make. Look at the form of biological organism. That is so much more complex. That must be the work of something beyond humans. Right. Right. Well, they're right. It is the work of something beyond humans in the sense that this phenomena in the computational universe is going beyond what we use in our processes of engineering or have used in our processes of engineering. So, but it is a, it's a phenomenon that, in a sense, is a, is a pure formal phenomenon. It's a phenomenon where there are these simple rules. They make very complicated stuff. Now, but by the way, I mean, in, in um, uh, an interesting sort of sideshow to that whole thing is the story of biological evolution. And uh, people have this intuition that when complicated stuff is made, it must have taken a lot of effort to make it. That's sort of a, a fundamental intuition that we, we tend to have that, that I certainly had when I started exploring these things in the computational universe. And when people were trying to answer how, does, how do biological organisms get the complicated forms they get, people still found a need to find something complicated that must have happened to achieve it. And so when Darwinian evolution came along, people said, that's the thing. That's, yeah. you know, it is, it is not that things were sort of constructed in some supernatural way. It is that there has been this long process of billions of years and, you know, quintillions of organisms or whatever that have lived and died. And those processes of natural selection have gradually sculpted the complexity we now see. I think that's only a part of the story in biology. Hmm. I think that a big part of the story in biology is this process that we see in the computational universe that basically even fairly simple rules produce very complicated behavior. So if you're a biological organism and you've got some DNA sequence and it's making proteins and it's doing this and that and the other, and you are randomly picking that, that DNA sequence, it's like randomly picking a program to make things out of proto proteins. Right. And many of the things that get made have this phenomenon that even though the rules by which they're made may not be terribly complicated, the things that get made are very complicated. Now, in some places, biology is not able to use that. Some places it is. When you look at, I don't know, pigmentation patterns on mollusks, something I happen to have studied a bunch, you see these very complicated patterns. I don't think it's terribly useful to the mollusk, but the mollusk just sort of effortlessly produces that because that's the way the simple rules get got set up for the way its pigment cells uh, produce right. pigment. Now, what's interesting is actually Darwinian evolution, natural selection, is actually a damper on the complexity of biological organisms. When things are very complicated, it's hard for natural selection to engage and to sort of end up 
with, uh, with sort of the possibility for incremental improvement. You end up going from the organism that has this really weird, complicated pattern of, uh, of uh, you know, fins or something to some other organism with some other weird, complicated pattern. And biological evolution is really set up a little bit like calculus to deal with sort of incremental change. And so we don't tend to, in fact, in biological evolution, there is a, there is a slight force against complexity in biological evolution. There is a force towards complexity from this phenomenon in the computational universe. And we see that sort of mixture in biology. And it's sort of ironic that when you look at the sort of the history of kind of natural theology versus Darwinian evolution and so on, it's, it's all a bit muddled because, you know, natural theology was saying, you can't make this complicated stuff without going to lots of effort and putting in complicated rules. Right. Well, that's just not true. Mm. Um, then people say, well, okay, but we've got complicated rules. It's, it's the whole history of biological evolution. It turns out that's actually not the thing that most makes complexity. That's actually a thing that, if anything, is a damper on complexity. So it's a, it's a little bit of a complicated story. Right. So but when... Oh. Uh, I was just going to say, before we go back to Rule 30, you use the term uh, computation a lot in your work. Can you just describe to me what you mean by computation, the way you use it? Yeah, I, I mean, it's basically you have rules and you apply them Okay. over and over again. That's uh, it. Applied rules. Yeah, okay. I mean, it, it's it's some... Um, and, you know, our computers in their CPUs, they have defined certain machine code, certain opcodes and so on that define what the computer does. We feed the computer a program. It's like saying, this is the initial state of the system. And then all it's going to do, our computer is just, you know, a few billion times a second is just running those rules. It's saying, I've got this state that corresponds to the state of the memory of the computer or whatever. I'm going to run these rules on it. And it just keeps doing that. And, and that process of just repeatedly applying rules that's this phenomenon that in today's world we would call computation. The idea of applying abstract formal rules is not something for which you actually need you know, a computer made of silicon chips and things like this to do. It's something that is a formal abstract kind of thing, but the instantiation of it in today's world is through computers. And that's why I've, you know, at times I've thought, should I rename this? Because it's actually a more, a more general, a more abstract concept. But the fact is that in, in today's world, the only way that it's tethered to something people understand is through the actuality of computers. Right. And so we end up calling it computation. Speaking of names and labels, uh, Michio Kaku always uses this uh, God equation. He invokes God in, in physics. Do you think this is a useful label to be using in physics or do you think we should do away with it? It's a funny brand. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's uh, you know, I, I think that um, if you ask the question, you know, I, I think there is a lot of interesting, deep intellectual thinking that has gone into theology. I think that, you know, if you say to somebody, you know, what is God? That's a complicated question. People, you know, there's not kind of a, oh, I know, you know, we know exactly what the answer is. I think that uh, what we understand now about physics certainly has a lot of things to say about questions that have existed in theology. In fact, it's sort of interesting in, in very different parts of my life, studying foundations of physics and studying things like AI and computational language. In both of those areas, we run across things which have been thought about in sort of the, in the theological layer of, of, of thought. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, so for example, a, a, a good kind of thing to wonder about is, does the universe need something outside of it to kind of get it going? That's a that would be a question. Right. And you know, when people talk about sort of the simulation hypothesis, yeah. kind of the you know, it's the modern version of of a very uh, often very primitive kind of version of sort of the theological god, so to right. speak, um, where it's like you know, back in the day, people were like you know, God is in the clouds, controlling like puppets all the all the yeah. humans. You know, that that's a that's probably a rather sort of consumeristic throwing thunderbolts and <laughs> right i mean that that's you know that's not the deeper theological thinking about about what's going on right but in a sense the simulation hypothesis is back to something a little bit like that of saying we're all just part of a video game and there's a there's a you know an, an uber being that's sort of a godlike being that's that's running the video game and uh and you know we're all uh, merely players in it so to speak what right. what has happened from our physics project 
is somewhat to my surprise, I think it's been possible to untangle some of the kind of science meets philosophy, perhaps meets theology uh, to that whole story. And so I think we, we now have actually a pretty decent understanding of how to think about this. And you know, then you can decide depending on your view of what, you know, what God is and your kind of theory of theology, you know, is, is, is this all about God? Is it, does it leave no room for God? Right. That's, a, that's a, a very, you know, that's a, a question of theology that's, that's interesting to talk about. Mm. And I think that, um, uh, you know, for example, a, a, very, a very typical kind of view of this kind of thing, like Spinoza, had this kind of uh, thing, you know, the universe is the thoughts of God actualized. Mm. So it's kind of this, this idea that uh, one of the questions is, if there is a thing, something that determines how the universe is, how much choice does it have in that determination? Right. That is, is there a, a God playing the video game who's saying, I'm going to put in this video cartridge, or I'm going to put in this one, and that's going to determine what the universe is like? Right. Or does that God have no choice? Mm. If the God has, you know, does the God have a free will <laughs> about what, how the universe yeah. is set up? And what we're realizing is from the physics project is there basically is no free will in the way the universe is set up. Right. And the universe is the way that, so, but what, what there is, is a question of how we interpret what exists in the universe. So in a sense, the universe is just this one thing that exists in a certain form that we, I think, have, have uh, very, uh, very excited to say, I think we've kind of cracked what that form is and, and what the sort of fundamental structure of the universe is. And then the question is, uh, can one then see, uh, you know, co co is there a choice about what the universe is like? The answer seems to be there is no choice. Hmm. But the thing about which there is a lot of choice is how we view that universe. Mm. So it's like saying the universe in physical space, big universe, but we're just at a particular place in physical space. And our view of the universe is based on the particular place where we happen to be in physical space. So in our model of physics, there's a slightly more elaborate thing we could talk about, which we call ruleal space which is basically a space of possible descriptions of the universe. And the, what we realize is that our sort of position in ruleal space, our choice of how we describe the universe, that is in some sense arbitrary. Mm. And so that, that is the thing in which determines our feeling about what the universe is like. It's got three dimensions of space. It's got uh, these kinds of structures and so on. Certain aspects of that uh, that that the the way that we describe the universe in terms of the kinds of forms of description that we have about things like space and so on, uh, that is that is something that is our kind of particular position in real right. space. That's our particular description language. Were we had we been built differently? Yeah, had we right. been some weird form of alien with all kinds of different senses and so on? We might have a different description of the universe, and that different description might be that that different description is still talking about the same underlying fundamental universe right but right. it is talking about it sort of at a different place in ruleal space just like we might talk about our physical our, our universe with respect to different places in physical space so okay. in a sense what if you ask sort of what is the the view of of how does this relate to kind of you know theological thinking about these kinds of things you know did the universe need a prime mover to get it going things like that um, the answer is, at a formal level, no, it, it, it just is, and one could kind of see why that happens. But then there's a lot that reflects back on us and kind of, it really matters that there are humans in the picture. We are, and our way of describing the universe is what determines certain aspects of, of how the universe works. Interesting. Um, let's go back to uh, Rule 30 for a second here. When I look at, uh, at this image, um, I'm just curious as to know what's happening when when I see this, you know, uh, what, what seems like uniformity on the left hand side, but on the, as we there's kind of a line where it starts breaking down and we have more of a random or free expression on the right hand side. What is going on there? Oh, I mean, there are lots of details of this particular rule, but what's uh, some aspects of this are more general interest. So, I mean, a, a different rule of the same general family wouldn't have that particular characteristic. But 
The thing that is more generally interesting is the following thing. So if you ask a question like, what's going to be the color of a cell a trillion steps down the center column of rule 30? We don't know the answer to that right now. We've not been able to run computations long enough to answer that. And there seems to be no way to answer that question more efficiently than basically just running a trillion steps in this rule. Okay, But there are certain aspects, as you point out, like on the left-hand side of the pattern, which seem to have more regularity to them. And what one's seeing there is a phenomenon that within any system that has computational irreducibility, there are always pockets of computational reducibility. Although there are some things that we won't be able to say, there are some things where we just have to do this irreducibly difficult computation to work out the answer, there will always be pockets or slices of what the system does that show some kind of reducibility where we can say things. Right. And a place where that's, that's super important, which I've really only realized with clarity in the last year or two, is, is in the universe and in physics. And here's why. When, if we look at sort of the underlying rules and the sort of what these atoms of space are doing and all that kind of thing, we've got this big, complicated, computational, irreducible mess. And if we were operating in the universe at that level, nothing about the universe would be predictable for us. That is, we would be saying everything about what's happening in the world is unpredictable. We wouldn't be able to, we wouldn't be able to kind of operate in the ways that we operate, which require some degree of predictability about how the world works. Okay, so then the, the question is, what are the pockets of reducibility that exist in this physics where there's all this computational irreducibility underneath? And so there are two, well, actually three major pockets of reducibility that, that we know about. And the thing that's just amazing and remarkable is those essentially three pockets of reducibility correspond to the three great theories of 20th century physics. And so, in other words, underneath at the sort of machine code level, there are atoms of space and they're, they're doing these very complicated things, but there are basically three slices of, of sort of the overall aggregate behavior that we can look at where there is a certain degree of predictability. And those three slices correspond to statistical mechanics, general relativity, the theory of gravity, and quantum mechanics. And, um, and, and that's sort of a, you know, that, that's a thing that we've kind of discovered in the last couple of years. I kind of suspected pieces of that a lot earlier than that. But that's, it's just a remarkable thing because it's basically saying that, yes, there is computational irreducibility underneath. There's a lot that we can't say about the universe. But if we describe the universe in the ways that we describe the universe, there are three big theories that we can uh, attribute to the way the universe is working. And by the way, those three theories are the great achievements of 20th century physics. Mm. Interesting. And the three theories being uh, quantum mechanics. Uh, well, uh, statistical mechanics. Relativity. Yeah. Relativity and quantum mechanics. Yeah. And, and okay. so, you know, the, the first one of those, statist uh, statistical mechanics, that's the second law of thermodynamics is sort of the most famous thing there. The second law of thermodynamics, law of entropy increase, yeah. is the thing that says if you start off with something that seems pretty orderly, like you have a bunch of molecules of a gas in one little corner of a box, mm -hmm. then what will tend to happen is that it will get more disordered over time. That's been, that was a, 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 a rule that was originally started being talked about in the late 1800s. And uh, it became sort of a, a cornerstone of lots of physics and chemistry and so on. This idea that you go from more orderly states to more disordered states. It's right. been very unclear why that's true. Hmm. In other words, people have, have had these kind of fake, de fake derivations of it that don't really work because they allow you to prove things like, well, things get more random as you go forward in time, but they also get more random as you go backward in time. Hmm. And that's not explaining why you were at this particular point that was sort of the least random. Right. So we, we finally actually understand how that works. And it's, uh, it's actually a story of computational irreducibility it's basically, here's how it works. So you say, I'm going to set something up to be simple. All right, that means that there's a sort of computationally simple description of how the gas molecules are arranged. Now let's just let the gas molecules do their thing. There's a bunch of computational irreducibility that happens in the gas molecules doing their thing. Then we say, okay, can we figure out what happened? If we are only able 
to do sort of computationally limited kinds of operations. We're able to make measurements where we're saying, let's, let's add together the positions of these molecules, things like that. We're not saying, we're not able to do sort of full cryptanalysis of this computational process. Then what we will conclude is that things got kind of random. If we were able to do sort of the full cryptanalysis, then we would say, well, actually, no, they, you know, we know where it came from. It came from the simple thing. But so it's the fact that we are sort of computationally bounded observers of gazillions of molecules of gas bouncing around in a box. Because we are computationally bounded observers, we can only say sort of average things about those molecules mm. that we conclude that the second law of thermodynamics is true. And so that's, a, that's an example of how our characteristics as observers determine the rules that we attribute to a system in physics. Interesting. And for example, one, one implication of that is people often talk about this thing called the heat death of the universe. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so, you know, people say, oh, in, in thermodynamics, one of the big issues is, it, is the motion of something organized like mechanical work, like you're moving all the atoms of a thing in some direction and it's the piston is moving or something, or is it just heat? And heat means that there are a bunch of, of molecules that seem to be bouncing around completely randomly. And the point is that if you want to get mechanical work out, you want to get some systematic motion of, of, of atoms, for example, like a piston moving, then there are big constraints on to what extent you can use that kind of randomness that corresponds to these atoms sort of bouncing around in, in a state where there's lots of heat. There's, there's sort of a limit to how much you can use that heat to get orderly motion out, and that's what determines the efficiency of, of uh, uh, thermodynamic devices and all, all kinds of things like this. But one of the things that's sort of a, a belief about what might happen in our universe is we go forward in time, eventually everything has just become completely disordered. The entropy of the universe measured in this way has become maximal, and all these atoms in the universe, all these molecules in the universe, they're just bouncing around randomly. And it's like, that's game over, you know, nothing interesting is gonna happen in the universe anymore. Right. But that's completely, the reason we say that is because we are thinking about viewing that in our way of viewing what's happening with these molecules, where we just say, oh, all we can tell is what the average number of molecules in this piece of the universe is. But actually, there's tons of details about the particular molecules bouncing around this way, that way, the other way. Those particular details contain huge amounts of information and are very complicated. It's just that from our view of the universe today, we say, we don't know anything about any of that stuff. It just looks random and uninteresting. Right. But so, you know, the, the, and that's why we talk about it as sort of the heat death. It's all over. Nothing interesting is going to happen. But actually, the interesting stuff is happening. It's just not uh, something that we would access with our usual way of thinking about what's going on in the world. Right. Wow. There's a lot of information to take in on that one. Uh, entropy is... Uh, um, I remember that concept being a hard one to understand when I when I started learning about that one, um, and I it's and usually I, very badly explained because people right. actually have not understood. I mean, this idea about computational irreducibility and computational boundedness of observers, this finally, after I don't know 150 years or something, actually shows one why the second law of thermodynamics works, and that has simply not been clear before. And so, when people tend to explain this, they they get very confused because the, the law of entropy increase says you start from an ordered system, it gets more disordered as time goes forward. Right. But yet, yeah. if you look at the individual molecules bouncing around, everything about how they bounce around is reversible in time. Every little collision between two molecules, you could reverse the movie of that collision and it would be as plausible a, a collision as, as the forward version. It's right. only when you get all these molecules together that it has this property that it sort of seems to get more random. And to understand that, the, the, I, mean, yeah, I can, can describe it in a bit more detail if, if, um, uh, uh, if we want, but, but um, uh, you, know, you, can, you can really understand what's going on finally as there really isn't anything that isn't reversible in time. Everything is still reversible in time. It's just that it's essentially an encryption process that's happening. And just like many, you know, any encryption process, you're encrypting things. The message is still there. It's just hard to get out. Right. And that's what's happening. And our ways of, of measuring things don't succeed in getting the message out of the system. It's still encrypted. 
And that's what's happening in, in, in thermodynamic behavior. That's what's happening in the second law of thermodynamics. The law of entropy increase is essentially, the, is essentially a phenomenon of computational irreducibility. It's a phenomenon that there's sort of computational, uh, uh, there's this irreducible computation that's being put into the system that we don't get to decode. And that's why the thing looks random to us, looks like it has higher entropy. Is that a common view of entropy, would you say, amongst physicists? Um, no. no. I mean, it's it's known to... Uh, there's a bunch of people who've studied my work who've done all kinds of things with it. Yeah. It's it's not... You know, the sad thing is that... It's an interesting thing. Like, you know, the second law of thermodynamics was actually one of the first kind of foundational things that I got interested in about physics when I was like 12 years old, and I was trying to understand how it worked at that time. Mm. It took me until I was uh, about 30 years old to actually understand it. Um, yeah. And that's still a long time ago now. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, uh, and, you know, I think that there's been, it's, it's interesting because I thought people had just sort of given up and nobody cared about the second law anymore. Um, and actually when our new physics project came out, which is mostly not about thermodynamics. That's that's really not a thing that it needs to talk about. Um, it, it, people will say, and what does this say about thermodynamics? And I'm saying, I'm glad you asked that because I think thermodynamics is really interesting. But in, in sort of the mainstream of physics, mostly people, uh, that's not a thing people study particularly is, mm. the, is the foundations of the second law. People who do study it, um, yes, they understand the stuff I've done, or at least they right. should do right. at this point. Um, but it's not been, it's not one of the sort of high popularity areas of physics in the last, uh, well, actually for about a century. Um, right. I want, I, I, I want to uh, change gears a little bit here. I want everyone to check out and play around with Mathematica and Wolfram Alpha. Uh, excellent tools for on-the-go calculations and inquiries. I think these are really, really interesting, fun apps. Uh, try and ask Wolfram Alpha some interesting questions and see see what kind of answers you get back. Um, can you uh, can you give me a brief description, uh, Stephen, of Wolfram language? Yeah, well, so it's the thing I've been building for the last basically forty years, thirty five years for the the main piece of technology. It's it's an effort to be able to describe everything in the world computationally. So the, the, the kind of the typical approach of a programming language like C or Java or Python or something is that the computer does what it does and you are being given sort of a wrapper by which you can control the details of what a computer does. Kind of the concept of Wolfram language is something different. It's to say, let's think about the world as it is with geography or chemistry or whatever else and let's try and describe that in a computational way, and let's provide a representation of those things in the world computationally that we can then use the sort of the power of computation to, 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 to work things out from. And, and, and in a sense, the way I view, so, so Wolfram language is also a powerful programming language that lo lots of people use, but the, the, the part of it that I think is the sort of the unique piece is that it's become this kind of full-scale computational language that actually tries to describe everything in the world computationally, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And the goal is to kind of collect all of the kind of knowledge, the, you know, what are the, the names of all these movies? What are the uh, places, the positions, the, you know, the populations of all these cities? What are the uh, characteristics of all these uh, prime numbers or something? Collect all of this knowledge in a computable form so that given that there's something that we as a civilization know, we should be able to make computations from that thing and also collect all of the kind of algorithms and things and put, put that in a framework where all these things can be kind of mixed together and used together. And that's kind of, so kind of the, the notion, I suppose in terms of the sort of long view of intellectual history, kind of what I see myself as trying to do is make sort of a notation for computational thinking in the same kind of way that people made a notation for mathematical thinking. I mean, if you look at sort of the history of these things, go back 500 years, people were talking about math. But when you wanted to describe math, the only mechanism that you had to describe it was words in a human language. And so that, and that really limited what you could do in thinking about things in terms of math. Right. And mathematical notation got invented and plus signs and equal signs and so on. And then kind of this mathematical way of thinking took off 
that led to algebra and then calculus and, and kind of the mathematical sciences. So my goal with Wolfram Language is to have a computational language that allows us to describe things computationally and enables kind of computational X for all X. So sort of just as the mathematical sciences enabled sort of mathematical uh, approaches to different fields, the goal of Wolfram Language is to enable sort of computational approaches to all possible fields. And sort of the, the consumer version of uh, a piece of Wolfram Language is Wolfram Alpha, um, which is what powers sort of computational knowledge in Siri and Alexa and things like that. Um, and uh, the, what that is doing is it's taking natural language, some question you ask, you know, or, or you know, you type in your first name, and it'll tell you all kinds of information about it. And it'll it'll predict how old you are. It's kind of fun because it knows. I, I, I was just gonna say that kind of freaked me out because I asked what it, what is my age, and it was only off by a factor of a year, uh, and I think three months. Yeah, you see, is this is where we should all complain at our parents because you know it turns out <laughs> like a lot of parents say. Uh, you know, this is a really unique name I'm giving my kid. And it turns out it's the, you know, you're at the point where the, the, the maximum number of Travises are being born yeah, or yeah, something. Yeah, exactly. But, but, um, no, I, I think that the, um, uh, the, the point, but if you try to understand, you know, what, what is Wolfram Alpha, it's, what it's doing is it's taking those natural language questions you ask in English, and it's trying to uh, understand that natural language. It's trying to do natural language understanding to turn that into the precise symbolic language that is Wolfram language right. from yeah. which it can then go compute the answer to the question. But, you know, in the bigger picture, I suppose, is, is, you know, what I'm trying to do with Wolfram language is to sort of automate as much as possible about what we intellectually have to do. And another way to think about it is the following. We've, we've learned from sort of basic science that the computational universe of what programs can do is amazingly rich. Even an incredibly tiny program can already do the kind of stuff Rule 30 does. You can do, you can do amazingly complicated things, even with extremely simple programs. So then the question is, OK, we've got this immense power in the computational universe. How do we make use of it? What do we humans actually want to do? What are our kind of goals? What, what do we, and how do we describe what we want to do? So I right. see Wolfram Language as a, as a big part of the, 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 the point of it is to make a bridge between the things we humans think about and the things that can be done in the computational universe. It's kind of this ocean of computational possibility, and we are using Wolfram language to kind of define what it is that we want to have happen, and then we kind of get that actually to happen in this computational universe. And that, that, there are many places where this ends up being important that, that are perhaps not, uh, you know, what one thing is, you're sort of defining something for some scientific problem, something like that. Another is, you know, you've got sort of the AIs that are, in a sense, able to mine the computational universe and do all these complicated computational things. Right. And then you've got us humans saying, well, we want to define what it is that we want the AIs to do. Right. It's like, what's the contract <laughs> that we write with the AIs yeah. to tell them what we want? Hmm. And you have to have some language in which to define that contract. And in a sense, one of the things we're trying to do with Wolfram Language is provide sort of that bridge from the things we humans want to talk about and want to describe and want to define as our goals and what is implementable in the computational universe. From a, now, uh, I was just going to ask, from a software uh, engineering perspective, what are the hardest questions for Wolfram Alpha? Like, what are the most difficult ones? I don't know, you can ask it some math question that it just has to go crunch for a long time to, right. to answer. I mean, there's, there's, there's several layers But the there, philosophical so. ones must be like hopeless. trying to Absolutely get... Absolutely yeah, hopeless. Yeah, right. Hopeless. <laughs> I mean, the, you know, the, the first question is, so in Wolfram Alpha, you know, we've got this very imprecise tool of human natural language. And the first step is, can it understand what on earth you meant? And... One of the things that is really good uh, and was the thing that was I realized sort of after the fact was the reason that it was possible to build Wolfram Alpha when people in sort of the AI world had tried to build question answering systems for 50 years, basically, and it always failed. And the, the, the thing that I only realized after the fact was part of the problem was that they thought there was an abstract way to understand natural language, that you could just sort of abstractly say, I've understood it. Mm. But what I realized is 
we have this language, this symbolic language, this precise computational language that we could, that we, we had a definition of what does it mean to understand natural language? Well, what it means is you're translating it from this kind of uh, a rather imprecise thing that we humans are, are, are yakking with to this precise symbolic language that we have precisely defined. That's what it means to, to understand natural language. So first step is there can be natural language. It's really hard to understand that we humans don't understand that uh, our way of turning it into precise symbolic language doesn't succeed at doing. Then uh, the question of, of what's hard to answer within that precise symbolic language I mean, there are one of the features of sort of understanding computation is you realize there's this phenomenon of computational irreducibility, and it's not too hard to ask a question where inevitably you're throwing yourself into computational irreducibility. And, and sometimes there are questions where you say, so computational irreducibility might say, you want to know what happens after a trillion steps, you have to run a trillion steps to see. But if you ask a question like, what will happen in the end? what will happen even after an infinite amount of time, that's a question that there may just not be any finite way to answer. And that's what happens in Gödel's theorem, for example, is you're, you're asking questions which end up being undecidable in the sense that there's no, there's no guarantee that there's any finite procedure that will answer that question. And so it's perfectly easy to define things in Wolfram language where that general type of question, the answer is undecidable. It's not oh, that was a difficult piece of software engineering. It's like, sorry, the formal structure of, 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 of everything is such that that question cannot be answered in a finite way. Right. Well, actually, to be, to be a little bit more complicatedly philosophical about it, the, um, uh, that question can't be answered in, in our universe. And the question is, could there be another universe in which that question was answerable? Mm. And you could just say, well, I'm going to make a universe which whose rules are the answers to a bunch of questions that can't be answered in our universe. And so you might say, okay, great. Then that means I can make a universe. I've got sort of free will in making a universe that can do things that our universe can't do. Right. The problem is what turns out to happen is that there's an event horizon, kind of like what happens at the edge of a black hole between our universe and any universe that has those sort of enhanced question answering capabilities. So you can say, well, that might exist in some sense, but it doesn't really matter because there's this, there's this you know, unpenetratable event horizon that separates our universe from that sort of super universe, so right. to speak. So, so you mentioned event horizon, black hole. It triggered something in my head to do with film, interstellar. Now we have to jump to Arrival. You created the alien language with your son. No, Is no, that... we didn't create the oh, alien language. Oh, you didn't language. create we, it. We got to simulate being you... scientists trying to understand the oh, alien Oh, okay, language. okay. You got Which to simulate. Which was kind of, kind of okay. more fun in some ways. Inter... Yeah, <laughs> no, totally. That, that would be fun. Okay, so you got to be on the side of the the attempt of d discovering it so that must have informed the script yeah the well what what happened you know it's movies are complicated creatures you know i right. i when we bring out a new version of wolfram language i think it's kind of the uh it's it's comparable effort and comparable number of people to a typical big movie so i kind right. of I, it's kind of for me it's interesting even to see these movies because the one thing that's different is i think you know, movies always come together with people like, I'm here for two weeks just doing this part of this movie. Yeah, yeah. And, it, you know, software engineering tends to be a bit more systematic. But, um, uh, you know, I, in, in that particular case, uh, we got involved very late in the, in, the, in, the, in the process of making that movie. And it was like, well, you know, let's add some science to this movie. And, and way too often, people making movies uh, just say, you know, it's like, like adding the science is like dressing the characters in a certain way, mm -hmm. and um, uh, which and you know there's a certain value to getting the the set dressing correct, and there's sure. a certain value to getting the science correct, and there's a tremendous tendency for two things to happen. First of all, the people making the movies just don't know who to call, and second of all, they'll call some academic, and the academic will look at the script and they'll say your script is wrong, and. That's a bad. Right. <laughs> that's a bad start. And you know, the times I've been involved in doing this, what's what's actually fun is say, look, let's just take the script as the way the world is, right? And then let's try and figure out, you know, what's the, how can you wrap 
science around the script as the script is. So You're a director's dream because that's a, a director wants someone like you, not the person that's going to come to the room. Oh, you need to throw it out. It's all wrong. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, right. Well, I, except I, you know, for example, on Arrival, I, I was kind of interesting. It was one piece of the script that seemed important to me to the story, but, you know, who's to know what's eventually going to come out? Well, I went to tremendous effort to, with great contortion to figure out how to, how to structure that in a way that made some scientific sense. And right. then, you know, then it's like, well, that's nice. Okay, but we're just going to cut out that scene. Right. <laughs> because, uh, um, no, I, I think it, it's, um, Arrival is, is actually the, uh, the, the, it's kind of the, the concept of, you know, how do the aliens view the world? That's an interesting concept. It's a concept that kind of, uh, you know, philosophers have used as a kind of foil throughout the ages. But I think we really get to think about that in a much more serious way with our physics project, because what has become clear is that the laws of physics, as we currently kind of uh, have them, are deeply a consequence of certain aspects of the way we humans work. So, for example, the notion that things, there is a notion of space and that things progress through time but there is a definite notion of space. The reason we think that is because the speed of light is fast compared to the processing speeds of our brains. So, you know, we look around us, what we see, you know, out to the, you know, the trees I'm seeing through the window type thing, yeah. um, you know, the distance to those trees is such that the time it takes light to come from those trees to my eye is very short compared to the time it takes the neurons in my brain to respond to what's going on. So as far as I'm thinking, it's like this exists, the, you know, out to this region of space just exists and it is progressing through time. If we had a different way of perceiving the universe, you know, if we were, if we were smelling the universe, right. where the speed that something diffuses through the air is quite slow, we would have a quite different view of space and time. Mm. And so the fact that we have the view of space and time that we do is a consequence of the detail of roughly how big we are. We're not the size of planets. We're, you know, roughly a meter tall in, in round numbers, so to speak. Yeah. Um, and uh, the, uh, you know, that, that size scale combined with uh, processing speeds of our brains and things like this combined with the speed of light, that determines a bunch about kind of the way that we perceive the universe, which then turns out to determine the kinds of laws of physics that we attribute to the universe. Right. Okay, and and you and you got to do this project with your son. Is this the first time you've worked with your son on something like this? Well, that was a number of years ago now. Gosh, yeah. it, was, it was like six years ago or something. And my right. uh, that was my younger son who was um, uh, gosh, how old was he at that time? Probably. No, this is where I get to do arithmetic. Probably <laughs> sixteen or something. Oh, okay. something, something like that. That must have but, been a um, lot of fun. Yeah, yeah, right. It, it was some. Um, um, I think. Uh, uh, he's a, you know, here's, here's the way that that gets funky is that, um, uh, you know, there's this whole Wolfram language thing that I've created. He's definitely a faster programmer in the language that I've created than I am. So wow. that's, a, that, that's kind of always a, um, yeah. uh, faster. And I would say more in some ways, a, a, uh, a more creative user sometimes of, of what we've built than I am. And that this is always what one, you know, what one sort of hopes for in the, in the intellectual things one builds is that, one builds some some sort of platform on top of which much can be built, so to speak. And and in, in, you know one of the things that I've been uh, quite happy about in my kind of uh, trajectory through life is that I've managed to sort of build these layers of science and technology and sort of successive layers of science and technology which do build on each other. Like the physics project, I was just kind of enumerating, you know, what made the physics project possible, and it's a collection of ideas in science, actual technology, sort of situations that I'm in in the world, things like this. It's a pretty thin, in the end, it's a pretty thin corridor, so to speak. Mm. It's, uh, uh, and I, you know, it makes me kind of, it's a funky thing because I'm like, this project might just not have happened for 50 years, 100 years, or never. And um, it, it's, you know, it's just coincidence that these various things aligned at this particular time and you know, one of the things that's strange for me is in building Wolfram Language, you asked what's difficult about it. The, 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 in a sense, the, the, the most intellectual heavy lifting that's involved in building it is designing it. That is, you're, you're building this thing 
that's going to have thousands of different sort of primitive functions that represent all these different kinds of things in the world. The question is, what is the correct kind of underlying way to think about these things in the world that allows you to design them as primitives in this language? It's kind of like, there are all these things in the world, you have to kind of drill down to figure out what are the primitives from which all of that stuff can be built. And then you, you create that as a piece of technology. And this process of kind of taking all these different domains and drilling down and understanding what their fundamental elements are, that's been a thing while well, I've spent 40 years doing that kind of thing. And uh, it, I, I don't know whether it gradually gets easier. It's maybe the domains we, we tackle get harder. Right. It seems like it always stays pretty difficult. Yeah. Um, but the thing that's been interesting for me about that is it's forced me across sort of all these different domains of, of uh, sort of human endeavor to think about this question. What is fundamentally sort of computationally at the root of these different domains. And I, I think, as I sort of was realizing recently, that's given me a, a completely unique view because I've ended up, you know, looking at all these different areas, which nobody else has had any particular reason to do. It's like that's driven by the fact that I'm building this piece of technology that is trying to address all these different areas, and I'm trying to see how they, all these fit together. And so I have to understand all these areas, um, and that's that's been very critical because in this physics project, there's a lot of intuition and methodology and so on that comes from all sorts of different places that has ended up being assembled in, in what we're thinking about in terms of, of, uh, of fundamental physics. And the, the kind of the raw material that we're using is very different from the raw material that's been used in a lot of existing mathematical physics. One thing that's very wonderful and sociologically terrific, actually, is that the you know, what we've provided is kind of a machine code on top of which you can hang a lot of physics, but it's turning out that a lot of the sort of greatest prides of mathematical physics actually do apply to what we're talking about. You can, you can kind of hang these existing achievements in mathematical physics on top of this kind of low-level machine code that we've built. And it's both very informative for what we've built and it's very informative for these areas of mathematical physics. So that's a great thing because often when sort of a new paradigm enters a field, it's like, well, there's all this stuff that was being done before. Oh, that's all, you know, throw that all away. Let's start over again. Right. That's not what's happening here. What's happening here is we've got a new foundation. We've got a lot of new things that can be done, but the old things that were already done fit really beautifully. And what we seem to be providing is a solid foundation for those things, which often didn't have a solid foundation. It was like, this is a nice piece of math, but we don't really know how it relates to physics. Well, now we do. And, and so you can now, with, with greater sort of pride and, and greater uh, sort of effectiveness, build the tower of that kind of mathematics and have it be useful. Interesting. Okay, we, we only have a few minutes left here, but quickly, I want to give a shout out to everyone who's listening on Live 365 Radio, which is home to the new Pangburn uh, radio station, and everyone who's listening on YouTube. Uh, Stephen Wolfram is going to be joining us for our monthly uh, Q&A uh, at 5 p.m. Pacific time today. Um, so I encourage you guys to, to uh, engage in that. If you want to get access, go to pang-bird.com forward slash subscription and you can get access there. And uh, we will be meeting on Discord and then transferring over to StreamYard to hang out with uh, Stephen. Again, that's at 5 p.m. Pacific time. Uh, so get your questions ready and join us for that Q&A. Um, so uh, I just want to uh, go to criticisms now, Stephen. Um, what are some of the criticisms that you face from other physicists regarding your work? You know, it's interesting. 20 years ago, when I kind of had really studied this computational universe and a lot of its implications, I put out this big book called The New Kind of Science. And in basically every field other than fundamental physics, I think that was very well received. It provided sort of a new modeling methodology and people in and whatever, you know, in, in social science and biology and in, in uh, people interested in kind of creating generative art, all these kinds of things, uh, you know, they found it really, it really was something that was a, an important new platform for them and something very useful. In fundamental physics, which sort of uh, from a personal point of view have been the field that I've been involved in myself, so I knew most of the people in that um, in that area, it was like, oh my gosh, this is terrible. This can't be true. And it's like, and, you know, people were saying, if this is true, what we've been doing for the last 50 years is all nonsense. 
And it's like, I kept on saying, that's not the case. Right. It's going to, it's going to coexist. It's all going to be good. Right. But, right. Um, um, but at the time I didn't, you know, I viewed physics as being just a use case of the more general kind of new kind of science that I was building based on sort of studying the computational universe. And I had only got a certain distance in understanding how it would apply to fundamental physics. And so people were saying, oh, but it doesn't deal with this. It doesn't deal with that. Well, yes, because we only just started here. Right. And, and in fact, that kind of put me off from, from exploring that because, you know, I, I, I work on a bunch of different things. And one of the things that's really nice when you build tools is people say, thank you for building that tool. Right. And that's, yeah, yeah. that's nice. Yeah. And then, you know, in this case, it was kind of like the market is physicists. And why am I going to build something where people are going to say, please don't do that project? Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, so, so I didn't do it for a long time. And then a couple of young physicists uh, kind of got me re-energized a couple of years ago now. And uh, we really, you know, went in for sort of the, the, the final sort of uh, final thing, which worked vastly better than I ever imagined. I thought we would be able to talk about, you know, what happened in the first 10 to the minus 1,000 seconds of the universe. And we'd be kind of stuck there. But, uh, but that didn't happen. We were able to get vastly further. The big surprise right now, because I'm kind of a student of the history of science, the big surprise is how little criticism we have. Right. Things are going, you know, in terms of sort of absorption in the world of physics and mathematical physics, it's going really well. And what's happening is there are these fields of mathematical physics, you know, higher category theory, uh, causal set theory, all kinds of things with, with different names. There are these fields where people have been pursuing them for many years, doing very interesting work, but without a, a great deal of solid grounding in how does this really connect to what happens in physics. Right. Now there is a connection. They're really excited about it. We're really excited about what's possible to do by using the methods that they have. And it's really a good story. Mm. And I think that the, um, uh, it's, it's kind of strange. It's kind of, you know, I, what's happened to me in a bunch of different times as I've, you know, I've worked on a bunch of things that have been sort of taken fields in different directions. Here's what I've noticed. There are times when fields have very high self-esteem. And at those times, if you say, I've got something new to say, they say, we don't need your new thing. We're just <laughs> fine, thank you. You know, we've just got a bunch of pitchforks here. Right. There are other times when fields are actually in terrible shape, where things you know, like this had happened with AI at the time when Wolfram Alpha came out. It's like people have been trying to do a bunch of stuff in that area. Nothing worked. So then we had something that actually worked. Didn't work using quite the methods that have been pursued in that field. But people were like, hey, this is great. It's something that's working. Right. So physics, I think, now versus 20 years ago, it's a little bit of less, you know, people 20 years ago were still like, string theory is going to do it. We're going to solve everything there. That obviously didn't happen. And um, while what was done there is very interesting mathematically and very connects very beautifully with what we're doing, it, it didn't kind of nail the problem because it's looking in slightly the wrong direction, I mm, think. Interesting. And uh, so, you know, I think what, what's, what's happened now is, uh, as I say, from the point of view of, of being a student of history of science, it's 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 an interesting moment because the the paradigm, the methods that we're using, the underlying methods are rather different from what has been done in physics. The layer above that can use existing mathematical physics in a very nice way. The slightly weird thing that's happened is that there are places where our models can be used to actually do calculations in physics, and they look to be very good practical ways to do calculations in physics. And we're starting to see some cases where people say, that's a great way to do practical calculations in physics. We're going to use it. All good. Now you say, but it's based on this model that has implications for how the universe actually works at an underlying level. And they're like, well, that's nice. We don't really care about that. What we care about is that this can be used as a thing that can be used for practical calculations, for working out you know, things about black holes or whatever else. It's a, it's a good way to do the practical calculation. We don't really care about what the underlying sort of philosophical basis of it is. Right. And that, that's a, so that's a, that's a different kind of thing. When people say, you know, is your model correct? Well, you know, people might be using it for tons of things. And it's like, well, then you can, you know, it's, it's like a little bit like what happened with um, photons actually back in the day when, uh, when, they were, when they were young, so to speak. It's like, well, you can calculate things in terms of them, but do you have to actually say they really exist? That's a different question. Right. Um, and uh, so, so I think that the, uh, that's sort of one of the dynamics that's happening. I think the thing that will be, you know, there are, 
one of the things that's always great for science theories is when you uh, do one of those tricks where you say, I predict this is going to happen. Then somebody does the uh, experiment and they say, by golly, that's actually what happens. Right. Um, we are, you know, maybe within a year or two, we'll have things where we can actually, with decent uh, sort of certainty, tell people, turn this telescope in this direction and this is what you'll see. Amazing. Um, that, that's, uh, uh, you know, there's a lot of depth of actual, you know, calculating things in physics and so on that you have to do to get to that point. I want to get your reaction to this. Uh, Lawrence Krauss stated on our Q&A, and I'm paraphrasing, that he loves Mathematica and Wolfram Alpha, but that your interpretation of the underlying discoveries you think you are making are not shared by others in the field. What's your response to that? I don't know. I think Lawrence wanted to get me on his podcast, so maybe he can explain that in more detail. Oh, okay, okay. Interesting. So okay. I think uh, I, I would, you know, the thing to understand about the kinds of things we're doing is it, it's a it's a big tower of ideas. And if right. you just say, you know, I'm just going to come in and spend 15 minutes and get the main idea, and I think I'm a fancy physicist and I know everything, and I'm just going to spend 15 minutes and I'll get the whole thing, you're not going to get the whole thing. Right. You, you're going to, you know, I mean, we've been, doing these uh, uh, summer school, winter school study sessions and so on. For you know, serious, engaged physicists, it seems to take about a week for people to understand what, you know, what's, what's going on. For, for well-educated, serious physicists, it takes about that amount of time. So you know, it's, it's one of these things where if you just say, gosh, I think I know this, let me, you know, pull right. that. Right. I don't know whether that's what Lawrence is doing. Maybe I'll find out if I'm on his podcast. But, <laughs> well, I, I but, look forward um, to you guys I, talking. I think that yeah. the, um, um, uh, you know, I, I think that's not a very, uh, uh, you know, these, these um, uh, at this point, we are past the point where somebody's going to say, uh, as far as I'm concerned, where, where it makes any sense for somebody to say, oh, this, you know, this is all wrong because I can immediately you know, come up with this one sentence disproof. We're, we're way past that point. Right. I mean, the, you know, the, the thing that, uh, you know, this question about, you know, oh, is this, you know, is this way of interpreting something that happens about uh, the Higgs particle right? That's a more complicated issue, but that's, that's way down in the weeds. That's not at the right. level of, is this whole approach, you know, totally crazy? It's, it's clearly not. Right. And, and it's, it's, it's um, you know, I think one of the things that's interesting when, when New Kind of Science came out, um, I think I, I was writing a thing when the physics project came out about sort of the history of that. And I, I ended up with a, a sentence that I rather liked after I'd written it, which was a, a parade of Nobel Prize winners with pitchforks, right. which was my <laughs> kind of description of them. Um, but but I, haven't, I haven't gone back. You know, it's the 20th anniversary of New Kind of Science next year. And I was planning to write a review of some reviews. That would be and great. I was I, I was that. told by some somebody that that they're really embarrassing. I mean, it's like like in a sense that it's it's one of these things where people write about sort of paradigm shifts and so on, and people talk about you know a way of thinking and it changes. Yeah. You know what I was just told by somebody who I consider knows what they're talking about. They had just been looking at some of these, and it's like these are really embarrassing. These are you know these are things where you know. These are scientists who were serious scientists. Many of them are not alive anymore, but but um, uh, you know they were serious scientists, and they should have known better. They should have even understood right. the history of science better to be able to know when there is something which is paradigmatically different from what's gone before. It is not. It just doesn't work to say, "Oh, that's all nonsense," because it doesn't follow the previous paradigm. Right. Um, that that's a. Uh, you know that that's kind of a doomed thing, and it's something teaching you know, an old dog new tricks. It's basically what we're talking about here. Well, yeah, <laughs> you know, from from the point of view of of careers, people, you know, they understand certain methodologies, and that's what to you know they're going to go look for for nails for which their hammer will work. And I'm certainly, uh, you know, I'm a product of that phenomenon as well. And you know, for me. I, you know, I try to make sure that I pick nails where the hammers that I have are actually going to be useful right. and uh, to, to avoid nails where the hammers that I have and the ways of thinking that I have are just going to lead me into nonsense, so to speak. Right. Um, and uh, you know, I think that's a, that's a very important kind of meta skill, which I, which I like to think I have a decent measure of. 
Right. And uh, but but yeah, no. I mean, I think that's a. Um, uh, it's the dynamic of of sort of how how people's view of the world changes and what causes it to change. You know, I when I was writing New Kind of Science, I wrote this preface where I basically said, you know, when people read this now, it will seem very surprising, and people will say, how can it possibly be true? After some number of years have gone by, people will say this is completely obvious. How could anybody have not thought that this was true? Right. And we're we're for for a certain stratum of people, we're now to that point where people are like computational irreducibility. How could that not be true? Whereas um, in uh, you know twenty years ago, that was how could this possibly be true? And I think it's a it's kind of interesting to watch this sort of inexorable process. I mean, the thing from the point of view of all this modeling with computation and so on, um, it's uh, uh, people had said, look, we've had mathematical equations for 300 years. How can we possibly displace that? And in fact, in the last 20 years, new models of things predominantly get made with programs, not with equations. And oh. so that, 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 that happened. It was, you know, right. and, and to me, I don't take any particular... You know, I'm not patting myself on the back particularly because it was seemed completely inexorable. It didn't seem like that was a, you know, it seemed like once you know this idea that you can use programs instead of equations, it is inexorable. That that's how things will go. Right. And I think the same is true with a bunch of these ideas about computational language and about um, about even things we're doing with this physics project. Um, but the question is only, you know, do those do those ideas and artifacts from the future actually arrive now? Or do you have to wait for 50 or 100 years for them to arrive? And that's, a, that's more of a sort of social dynamic. And for example, the fact that there's good absorption of what we're doing in physics right now is a, is a feature of the particular sociology of physics at this time in history. And it's cool. It's great. I'm, I'm glad people are having fun you know, working on our kind of stuff. Great. And I think we ran out of time. And I know I have to go. Yeah, something we different. did. And, and I thank you so much for your time. I will see you again at uh, 5 p.m. Pacific time. And Stephen, this has been uh, amazing. I'd love to have you on again sometime. And I just really appreciate your work and the products you've given to the world. So thank you very Thanks. much. Thanks. See yeah. you later. See you later. Bye-bye. All right, guys. Oh, <laughs> I killed my camera. <laughs> um, that was awesome. I really enjoyed that conversation. I'm just going to add my... Okay, there we go. Um, I hope you guys really enjoyed that uh, conversation. I, I have to get Stephen on again. I literally had like three pages more of things I wanted to talk to him uh, about. But that's okay. Can't do it all in, in one sitting. I, I'll get to some of the questions during the q and A. I I hope you guys consider... And, and by the way, thank you guys so much for engaging in the chat. Alexander, um, thank you for moderating. I hope you guys join us for the Q&A. You guys will have a chance to ask your questions one-on-one -on -one and have some back and forth with uh, uh, Dr. Stephen Wolf from... Um, uh, in that setting. So you, you have to go to pang-burn.com forward slash subscription, become a subscriber, and then join us on Discord. Uh, we're going to be meeting on Discord, and uh, then we're going to be jumping over to StreamYard um, just so Stephen doesn't have to join a new platform. So I hope you guys consider joining us for that. Uh, become part of the Penguin website subscriber family. Become part of our Discord family. Um, we have interesting conversations every day. They're all in good faith. They're not about like, you know, trying to score points on each other. They're just about having good faith, helpful conversations and, uh, and learning and upgrading our skeptical foundations and our moral foundations. So consider uh, joining us. Again, thank you to all of you who are listening on YouTube uh, and our new radio station at Live 365. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I, I just really enjoyed this conversation. I'm going to be thinking so much about this. Uh, but again, thank you all so much uh, for tuning in. Consider subscribing to the channel if you enjoy this podcast and the Penguin content. And as always, let art and science inspire. Thank you.